the farm that we lived on wasn't a very good farm and I did a lot of custom work and uh, my landlord didn't appreciate me not he didn't think I was paying enough attention to his place which was probably true but then the custom work is what what kept us going and uh, so one day he tracked me down when I was combining wheat for somebody and we got into it and that was the end of that so I went home that night and I told your mother I said uh, we're moving she said, where to? I said, I have no idea. I said, well, I don't think that's a very good idea. <laughs> so I knew I'd been uh, doing some custom work for Augie Restliff, and uh, I knew that uh, that house was available at the time. So we, we moved over there, and it was a very, very, very small house. But it, uh, it filled the bill. So we lived there, what, three years? Five years. Five years, mm -hmm. yeah. That's the house that, that Matthew was born in. And we didn't know where we were gonna put Matthew when he was born. There was our bedroom and then one other bedroom. And Todd and Tara shared that bedroom. And they had bunk beds, because it was probably about eight by eight. And so we weren't sure whether we were just gonna open a drawer and just <laughs> stick him in there. Or what? Well, then, uh, then uh, Augie and Carolyn let us uh, do some finish work downstairs in the basement. A lot of our story revolves around the basement. Anyway, so they made a, we made a, a bedroom down there for Todd and Tara, and then Matthew got the the little bedroom upstairs, and it all it all worked out. It, it's kind of crazy because there were no egress windows. There was a natural gas stove between the stairway to get out of the basement and their bedroom. Fire trap is what it was. It was a fire trap, but we didn't know any better, I guess. <laughs> I think my mother was worried about it, but Augie and Carolyn's youngest daughter became pregnant. And oh, son. He didn't come. Oh, yes, Russell right. Cheryl. Yes, it wasn't their daughter, it was their son, but anyway, that was an early pregnancy. They were both still in high school. And they got they went ahead and got married and dropped out of school and needed a place to live. So we had to find a place to live. So we started talking about buying a modular house and we kind of picked out where we could put it, which is where we ended up building. But um, his stepfather, Bud Ortegan, said, no, you don't want to do that. I'll just build you a house. So we found a floor plan on the back of a farm journal magazine, <laughs> and that's what we used to build the house. <laughs> we a lot, you know, we didn't have time to do a lot of soul searching about what kind of house we wanted, but that house served us very well, I think. We made a few changes into that original floor plan and raised our family there and lived there for over 30 years. 30 years. Yeah, yeah. when I got back from Vietnam, there was a program called Veterans Veterans Classes where you could go to ag classes, and they paid you $300 a month to go. And I put all that money in savings, so I had a down. So we had a down payment for the house. So then we spent all that for the down payment and then had an overrun of a third on the house and then the 80s came. <laughs> but we made it. We made it, yep. And the day that we paid the house off was a pretty happy day. It was a long time down the road, but <laughs> it was a nice feeling to know you owned your own home. They, they never did get along. I mean, they, I think he was 19 and she was 18 when they got married and it was... It quickly turned turned bad, and I can remember when I probably was eight or nine, and I, you know, we talked. I talked about having a playhouse out in the trees, and I can remember myself and Georgia and Shirley going out there. And at that early age, we talked about our parents getting a divorce. When we moved to Central City, that just made things worse because uh, when we first started it. We would come out to the farm on Wednesday night and see Dad, and then he would come in on the weekends. Well, finally, that, that 
kind of went by the wayside. And I remember when your mom and dad had their 25th, you must have been in Vietnam because we had a cake. We had some kind of a party or something. I suppose Georgia and Shirley were there. And it was in that trailer I lived in when you were in Vietnam. So they had this cake all decorated and happy 25th. <laughs> the pictures we took that day kind of told the story. They weren't too happy at that time. So then when I came back to the farm, uh, mom was living in Central City and he was living out on the farm under some pretty bad conditions, but he was, he was drinking heavily. And, and then, uh, well, I think I was 27, so that would have been about 70. Well, no, we, we were over at Augie's, though, so it would have had to have been about, well, 72, 73, somewhere in there, then they got a divorce. And that was, uh, that was pretty devastating to me. So it was tough, I mean, it's... But the good thing was that your dad quit drinking. Well, it wasn't a divorce, but from drinking. It was when he, when he married his, his second wife. She, she's the one that got him started, stopped drinking. I mean, she talked to him on the phone and he went to Norton, Kansas, took the cure and here he came home. Hopped on a plane, went down there and married her. Side on scene. I don't think he ever drank again. He never did. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah, so he was amazing. he was sober for 27 years, which I yeah. admire him very much for, because there's a lot of people don't 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 able to do that. Marge always told him, he said, if you start drinking, I'm going to start drinking. Nobody wants to start drinking. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, all my memories of Merton are as a sober man. I the rest of that just is gone. I mean, I got over it. I mean, it's still. Still something I wish hadn't happened, but I mean, it was, as time went on, I saw that they were both, both a lot happier with their, their new mates than they were with each other, so it, uh, I always tell people they were married 50 years, but they were two different people. They celebrated a 25th wedding anniversary between the two of them, and then they celebrated, both celebrated 25 years with the people they married after they got divorced. I was on my way to Riverdale. And Rask, I was doing some work as a grain inspector and uh, got just a mile west, of the, mile and a half west of where we lived and a guy blew a stop sign and hit me. Uh, driver's side, a little pickup. And basically came very close to killing me, about what it amounted to. And I don't remember too much more after that for several weeks. But. I remember it all. <laughs> Ron Weller called me that night, and it, well, it wasn't late. It was late afternoon, maybe. His so son was early, just going down, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Ron Weller called me and said that Rex had been in this accident, told me where it was, and so I piled all you kids in the car, and after we started down the road, I was only like two miles from our house, and after we started down the road, I thought, why am I taking these children to an accident scene not knowing what we're going to find when we get there. I mean, that was crazy. But by then it was too late, so then when we got there, there was no blood. And so I thought, oh, well, this is okay. This isn't that bad. He was talking. He was telling the rescue squad what to do and what not to do because he was currently on the rescue squad. And uh, he knew that his hip was shattered you know, I didn't know that at the time. So I followed, we followed uh, the ambulance to Grand Island and of course had to wait while they ran all these tests and whatnot. Georgia came and I don't remember, there were a lot of people there. And somebody must have got, took you kids home because when I was driving home, it was like one in the morning and and I got lost on the way home. I, I made a wrong turn and it's I raining real hard. Yeah, I I mean I just totally got lost and I thought, how oh, can I be lost? I drive this all the time. But you know, my mind was just not concentrating. 
So they were going to have to do surgery on his hip, and they couldn't do it in Grand Island because it basically was shattered, and they didn't have anybody that could do that. So they talked about sending him to Denver, and I, I think you were in Grand Island a couple days, maybe. Anyway, I went went in to see him, and, and he was still in intensive care, and they said we're going to fly him to Denver. If you want to ride along, you've got two hours, I probably was, you know, to get ready. So I came home, threw some things in a suitcase, went to the school, and told Tara and Matthew that we were going to Denver, and I'd be, in my mind, I know I thought I'll be back in a week. Yeah, and then that turned into almost six weeks. And I think about that often, how kind of just left you kids to fend for yourself. Todd was a freshman in college, Tara was a junior, and you, Matthew was a sixth grader. And uh, the neighbors brought him food. I, I understand they didn't want for anything to eat. I did come home once for junior senior prom, and uh, George and, I think it was George and Vale brought the kids down once, and I think my folks brought, brought them down once. So, you know, we didn't see each other in there, but still, it was a long time to, to let your family just kind of be there, but it, it didn't seem like I had a choice, because he was, he just, he just didn't know what was going on. He was asking me to do things that I knew I couldn't, I shouldn't do. He, his leg was in traction when we first got there, and he kept telling me to loosen the, loosen that up, and I said, I can't do that. Yes, you can, you just turn that screw right there. He said, you can do it. I said, no, I can't do that. And that was hard. And then after he had the surgery, he was, he was on some kind of medicine or something that made him hallucinate so he had all kinds of things he was telling me that I knew couldn't be true and to make it worse the, re the recovery room was being something they were doing some kind of work in it so all the recovery patients just went down to the basement <laughs> again <laughs> and everybody was in the same room it was it was a horrible experience <laughs> and then I mean when we finally did get home it was another year before So called healed. In reality, if she hadn't been there, I firmly believe this, I never have done it, but she hadn't been there, I would have made it because she was always there to take care of me, you know, talk to the nurses and stuff. And when I had a setback, she was the one that was there to kind of keep things moving. So. I remember trying to catch the doctors. You had to be there early in the morning if you wanted to talk to the doctors. And I tried to get there. You know, really early, so I could, because that was the only way you could find out anything is if you could be there when the doctors got there. And of course, he had, you know, he had a pulmonary doctor for his lungs. He had the, the surgeon that did his hip, and it's a teaching hospital, so there were all these interns and and people. It was, it was quite an experience. <laughs> you always learn. The Bible teaches that. Your life is formed when you have a university. Actually, when you, when I look back on it, it, it was, I mean, it's kind of hard to say it was the best thing that ever happened to me, but I mean, it, it had quite a positive effect on my life because, uh, I mean, I realized what, how important life was, and, uh, and all you kids, and well, us too, found out what, what, what your neighbors would do for you when you got in trouble, and it was just a, it was a very enlightening experience throughout. I mean, the neighbors did all my farming for one whole summer. Todd, Todd and Steve helped, but uh, it was, came out of it a lot, a lot stronger person than one of them. I know that. I remember the, when I think with George and Bill brought the kids down the first time, and I think it was the day that that you had your surgery because they were there when you sort of woke up in the operating room. But first thing, I mean, the very first words out of Todd's mouth were, so, why do you think this happened? What's the reason this happened? You know, and 
I just said that I don't know why it happened, but I can guarantee something good will come out of this. And it, and it did.